Thank you for joining us for our second Natasha's Law webinar. My name is Rachel Sortal and I'm the Marketing Director for Planglo and I'll be hosting the webinar today. We were inundated with questions last time and so we have decided to host a follow-up session kindly joined once again by Arvind Tandy from the Food Standards Agency and Callum Yule from Food Standards Scotland to answer all of your Natasha's Law questions and queries. Since the announcement of Natasha's Law, we've been helping thousands of customers to get compliant. And so our aim for this session is to help share our experience and for you to leave this webinar today feeling confident and able to tackle Natasha's Law with ease. We have a great lineup for you today, so I'll quickly run through the agenda and our key speakers. First, we are joined by Arvind Tandy from the Food Standards Agency, who will be explaining the allergen labelling changes that will go live in October 2021. Next, we are joined by Richard Newman, Head of Support for Planglo. Richard will be giving a short intro to Planglo, and then we'll be running through the Label Logic Live application and demonstrating how simple it is to get Natasha's Law compliant. We'll be rounding it all up with an extended Q&A session with all of our speakers, plus Callum Yule from Food Standards Scotland and Neil Steadman, Corporate Director for Planglo. Thanks to those of you that have sent through your questions already. Feel free to pop any you think of during the session in the Q&A box and we will aim to get through as many as we can. So let's get started by introducing Arvind Tandy from the Food Standards Agency. I'm Arvind Tandy. I work in the Food Hypersensitivity Policy Team in the Food Standards Agency and our work covers food allergies, intolerances and celiac disease. A really important area of work for us this year is the implementation of the new allergen labelling rules that will apply to pre-packed for direct sale food from 1st of October this year. So legislation has now been introduced in all four administrations um, and most recently Scotland has introduced its own legislation and it all has the same implementation date of 1st of October. So this labelling will benefit consumers by telling them what is in the packaged food they are eating and will allow those with food hypersensitivities to make safer food choices. Um, so just an illustration of where we're at at the moment. So for allergen labelling or for the provision of information on allergens, you can essentially consider that food falls into three categories. Um, so pre-packed, pre-packed for direct sale and non-pre-packed. So pre-packed food is food packaged by one business and supplied to another um, or where food is packaged by the same business at different sites. At the other end of the scale, there's also non-pre-packed food where food is not in packaging or is only packaged after it is ordered by the consumer. And in the middle, we have pre-packed for direct sale food, abbreviated to PPDS food. And before 1st of October this year, PPDS food is treated in the same way as non pre packed food. But after, from the 1st of October onwards, um, PPDS food will have its own distinct requirements, which will now differ from non pre packed food and which make it more in line with pre packed food. So at the moment, allergen information for foods that fall into this category of pre-packed for direct sale can be provided the same way as for non-pre-packed food. So this is in line with legislation that came into force in 2014. Um, so you have to provide information on the 14 major allergens, but you have some discretion on how that is presented to the consumer to take account of different business models. So you might have a notice telling customers to ask staff for more information on allergens. You might have the necessary information provided in an allergen book or in a specific allergen menu. In terms of the definition of foods that fall into this PPDS category, this applies to foods that are packed on the same premises or site from which they're being sold before being ordered by the consumer. And the term site can also refer to a building complex, such as a shopping centre or airport terminal, in which the same business operates from more than one unit within that business complex. PPDS foods can include foods that is packaged on other premises, but only if the food is offered for sale from a movable or temporary premises, like a marquee market store or a mobile sales vehicle, but must be packed by the same business that is selling it. Um, and PPD does not include 
food that is made to order or is packed to order and it does not include food that is not in packaging when it is ordered by the consumer. It's important to notify the, uh, to notice, to note the definition of packaging that applies to PPDS food. So food is PPDS if it is packaged so that the food is fully or partly enclosed by the packaging and where the contents cannot be altered without opening or changing the packaging. And the food is also a single item which consists of the food and its packaging that is ready for sale to the final consumer. Um, so for example, a salad box, a pack of sausages, a baguette in a closed sleeve, these are all examples of single items that are ready for sale to the final consumer and so would need PPDS labelling. Um, just to note, packaging doesn't have to be sealed to meet this definition. Um, as an example, you can have food in paper bags that are folded over or twisted or boxes shut with a tab. These would count as PPDS food as they meet this definition of packaging. It's also important to note the rules for distance selling. So if you sell a food that is defined as PPDS, but it's sold through means of distance selling, such as by telephone or online, you don't need to provide PPDS labelling. But any food business that provides food through distance selling will need to continue to ensure that you provide mandatory allergen information to the consumer for free before the purchase is concluded and at the moment of delivery. So the FSA has produced a decision tree to help businesses to check whether the food you offer is PPDS or not. Um, and you can find this on our website. There's essentially three key questions to consider. So if, for example, you took a burger that was made on the same premises as which it is sold, um, and it's packed at 11.45, wrapped and ready for the lunchtime rush under a hot lamp, you can apply these three questions. So firstly, you can consider, is the food presented to the customer in packaging? Yes, the food is packed. And the second question, is it packed, the package before the customer selects or orders it? Yes, the food is pre-packed. And is it packaged at the same place it is sold? Yes, it is pre-packed for direct sale. So if you can answer yes to all three questions, you produce PPDS food. So in terms of the actual change that's needed for this category of food, from 1st of October, PPDS food must display the, the information required, which is firstly the name of the food and an ingredients list with the 14 major allergens emphasised every time they appear in that ingredients list. Um, and you can emphasise the allergens through approaches such as using capital text or bold text. Um, and the information should be provided on the packaging or on a label fixed to the packaging. In terms of the substance of the labelling, be considering the name of the food, um, you should decide um, on a name which accurately provides a description of the product. Um, firstly, if there's a name prescribed in law, this should be used, but in practice it's only, it's only likely to apply to products containing certain seafood, fish and meat products as ingredients. If there's not a name prescribed in law, you can use a customary name, and this might be a name that is commonly understood um, by consumers. So for example, a bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich, or BLT sandwich. Um, but where there's not a customary name, you should use a name that enables a customer to, to um, uh, you should use a name that describes the true nature of the food, and so consumers can distinguish it from other products. So most um, food products will fall into this, this last category. In terms of the ingredients list, it should be headed with the word ingredients or another suitable heading that contains the word ingredients. Um, and it should be fo in, uh, followed by a list of all the ingredients with the allergens highlighted. And all the ingredients used in making the product should be listed in descending order of weight. Um, you can separate compound ingredients um, in order of weight, but it must be immediately listed, followed by a list of its own ingredients. So 
So for example, if you had a sandwich, you could list bread as one of the ingredients, but then you should include a list of the ingredients in the bread immediately after the word bread. Um, you should make sure that you emphasize the allergens within the list. You shouldn't use alternative statements such as contains milk and egg, for example. In terms of the format and font, the information, as I said, must appear on the package or on a label attached to the package, and it must be on the outside of the package. Um, and all the mandatory information must be easily visible, clearly legible, and it should not be obscured in any way. And the font size has to comply with legal requirements for the minimum size of fonts. Um, and you can find more information um, on those specific rules on our website. Just to note, labels can be handwritten, but you still need to meet that legal criteria for the size of font. Um, and just the point to note is that food businesses and their suppliers already have an obligation to ensure that accurate ingredients and allergen labeling is passed to consumers. And you'll need to make sure the information that you're getting from suppliers is correct and up to date and that you have processes in place to capture any ingredient, any changes to the ingredients that you use. Um, so you'll be able to do that directly by checking labeling on the products that you use to make your food products. Um, but if you've got automated processes in place, you might also want to check how your suppliers could proactively flag any changes in ingredients to you. So this is not a new requirement on food businesses. You just you st should still make sure correct information is being passed along the supply chain to the end consumer. Um, you can also provide voluntary information about the unintended presence of allergens using usually from unavoidable cross-contamination. And this often appears on packaging as may contain information or not suitable for. Um, for PPDS food, we advise that these types of statements are include are best placed on the lay PPDS label itself, but you can also provide this type of precautionary or voluntary labelling differently. So you can provide it in and through a sign that's present on the premises or communicate it verbally through staff. Um, but this type of precautionary information should only be provided if there's a real risk of allergen cross contact that you've identified after you've carried out a thorough risk assessment and where you can't remove the risk through actions such as segregation and cleaning. And if you have um, ingredients um, that you've used that have had precautionary allergen statements on them, this information should be passed to the, con to the consumer. Um, and you shouldn't use this type of information where there's not a real risk, as that could be considered misleading food information. Um, and you shouldn't use this type of labelling as a general disclaimer. Um, just a quick uh, comment on enforcement. Um, so local authorities inspect food businesses to check for compliance and will work with businesses to help ensure that they comply with the new PPDS requirements. Um, if a business is not complying with the new requirements, the local authority will be taking a proportionate approach to enforcement. Um, the approach they take will depend on how serious any non-compliances are and the willingness of the business to make improvements. So if local authorities find minor non-compliances, um, they're likely to issue advice in the first instance, but where a business fails to follow the rules, they might be fined. Um, and just to state that in the most serious cases, uh, for example, if a customer suffers an allergic reaction because the PPDS rules weren't being followed, a food business could be prosecuted by the local authority. Um, and in this instance, if someone is found guilty, if a business is found guilty, the courts can issue a significant fine, which is potentially unlimited um, and potentially imprison individuals. So that's just setting out how the enforcement landscape um, looks, but local authorities should be taking a proportionate approach to work with businesses. Um, and just to reiterate, um, the FSA has lots of resources available on our website. So we have a dedicated PPDS at Hub, um, and um, we've just added some more uh, specific sector guides, which provide information on PPDS for specific sectors, um, like schools and cafes and restaurants um, and mobile sellers. 
Um, we also have a technical guidance that was updated last year, which goes through all the different um, types of allergen information and labelling that can be provided for those three different categories of food. So not just PPDS, but non-prepacked and uh, pre-packed foods as well. So if you want to clarify um, and look at a source of information that help you determine what applies to different categories of food, then please do look at that. We also have an online um, e-training av available on our website, and that has some updated information on PPDS as well. Um, so just to reiterate, the changes come in on the 1st of October, so I would encourage you to look at the PPDS section on our website and also to say you can obtain business specific advice from your local authority um, and you can also send questions to us directly at the, at the FSA at our PPDS mailbox. Um, so I hope you found that summary useful. Many thanks, Arvin. That was great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to hand over to Richard Newman next, who's head of support for Planglev. For those that aren't familiar, I'm going to give you all a bit of background about Planglo. We are the people behind the market leading label printing software, Label Logic Live. We've been supplying catering businesses of all sizes across the world with labels and software for over 35 years, and more recently, compostable packaging. One of the unique things about us and our LabelLogic Live software is that it is specifically designed for the food-to-go sector. Our software is used by over 6,000 customers and since the announcement of Natasha's Law, we have been working with our customers of all sizes. From multi-site caterers, we cover three quarters of the contract catering market, and we work with many universities, schools, hospitals, right through to independent bakers and sandwich shops to get them Natasha's Law compliant. So no matter what size business you are, our system works for you. We pride ourselves in our service and support. We have dedicated regional account managers, as well as a team of support experts who are on hand to talk you through the whole process and answer any questions, should you need us. Our software has evolved with the needs of our customers. Our latest version is browser-based. This means that no installation is required and that any updates are instant. It also means that your software is always compliant with the latest legislations, including Natasha's Law. The software has been designed with ease of use at its core. All you need to print labels is an internet connected device to run the software and any printer, and then you're set, which means that no investment in hardware is required. LabelLogic Live can be tailored to your business to comply with Natasha's Law. It incorporates recipe building functionality with Eridus built in to provide seamless branded product and wholesaler data, which automatically highlights the allergens in bold. And if you already use a recipe management program, we have integrations with all of the leading recipe management systems, so you don't have to manually re-enter your data. We are always on hand to support our customers whenever they need us with lots of resources, including live chat and YouTube tutorials. I'm now going to run you through a demo of our label printing app, Label Logic Live, to show you how easy it is to get Natasha's Law compliant. Before we jump in, I would like to say Label Logic Live is an extremely flexible tool for you to utilize. We have decided to only scratch the surface of its capabilities during this demo, so if you would like to explore further, please contact us for a free month's trial. Now I'll jump into the application and show you what you would typically be doing day to day. Here is the print centre. You will spend a few moments daily selecting products to print for that day's or week's production run. You can use print lists to organise however you see fit. The majority of our customers will have a print list for their daily print run or weekly print run. Other customers will organise by product groups. I'm just going to select a print list. I'm going to change a few quantities and then I'm going to generate the label PDF for you in real time. I'm going to enter the expiry date here. Click on print. And here is the generated PDF that you would send down to the printer. So that's how easy LabelLogic Live is to use day to day. You'd go into the print center, type in a quantity and hit print and then send your PDF to the printer. If you want to create products, we need to access the product center. To do this, 
click on Home and then click on Products. The Product Center is where you will do all of your product entry. We have categories that you can create to organize your products. The majority of people would create different categories for different product types. However, this is completely up to you to organize as you like. I'm going to set up a category called Panini to store my Panini products. It will now allow me to choose what fields I would like in my category. As you can see, LabelLogic Live comes with a vast range of fields, from barcodes, allergens and calculator shelf life to name a few. You can utilize these to display whatever information you need onto the label. Further down the line, if I wanted to add the nutritional or reference intake fields, we would just need to enable them within the category editor here. The products within this category could then generate the information based on the recipe we set up for the product. For this demo, I will add the title, price, recipe and ingredients fields. As I've added all the fields I require, I will now scroll to the bottom and click Done. I'm now going to create my Panini product. I'm going to choose a category and select Add. First, I'm going to give the product a title, now a price. Now we will build the recipe for the product. This is like making it in the kitchen, so be sure to add everything you would typically include. First, I'm going to add smoky bacon. I can either find it in my frequently used, or if I wanted to search, I just type in the name. Once I click on it, that adds it into the recipe list. Here, I can filter results from the different wholesalers I have enabled on the account. As you can see, I only have a small selection of wholesalers enabled for this demo. If you would like a wholesaler enabled, please contact support at planglow.com. We will now add the rest of the ingredients to the product. I'm adding lettuce next. I'm now going to find our tomato using its product code so I can be sure I'm using the right one. And finally, I'm going to add the panini roll. Once completed, click on Done. Once you've finished adding all of the ingredients, it's important to enter the correct weights for each ingredient as it will affect the ordering of the items within the ingredients field. Now we will link the recipe we have built to the ingredients box by clicking the blue link button. You can see that all of the ingredients are listed in descending order and any allergens present have been bolded. The product is now set up. I don't think it was my fastest time, but we will have you labeling confidently in no time at all. I'm just going to save the product we have entered. You can always come back to edit products once they've been set up. I'm now gonna return back to the home screen. The template designer will allow you to design templates to your needs. Some of you may want to add a logo or tweak the positions of where the details of your product print on the label. In addition to our stock labels, Planglow can provide bespoke label designs. If you have a bespoke label with us, you will see it appear here. We have lots of our stock labels set up with compliant templates you can use. If you are using one of our smaller label offerings, such as the Gastro 16 per sheet, we have set up a two-part label so you can use these to print a front and a back label that includes the ingredient listings. I'm going to go use our Gastro 6 label to demonstrate some of the changes you can make. You can either search for it on labels per sheet, or you can type in the name itself. Once I've chosen the label, I can choose one of our many stock templates. For this instance, I'm going to choose the Natasha's Law compliant template. Now the label is on the screen, I can tweak it by adding a logo and changing the font. To add a logo, I just choose the fixed images on the left hand side, and if my logo doesn't appear, I can always upload a new image to the system. I'm going to choose the food hut, and I'm going to position that just above the titles, like so. Once I have that in position, I can now change the fonts of any fields that I wish. In this instance, I'm going to change the font of the title. I select the title, I can now go to the edit screen, and I can choose a new font. 
I can also change the alignment and the font colour along with a few other options in this system. While I'm in the template designer, I'm going to set a minimum font size that will warn us if the font drops below a specific size when generating the label PDF. This is an important requirement for Natasha's law legislation, as there will be much more information printed on the label and we will need to ensure this can be read. The height of the font must be equal to or be greater than 1.2mm, so for the font that I'm using, I'm going to set the font size to 7. To do this, select the field, scroll down the edit box until I come to the print time warnings, and I can enable the font size drops below minimum, and I can increase that to 7. If you need any support setting up the label templates, please contact one of the support team. I'm now going to save the changes made to this template. We will call this template Webinar to keep it simple. I'm now going to return back to the home screen. We will now go to the Print Center to use this template for the Panini product we entered earlier. We could add the Panini product to one of the existing print lists, but I'm going to create a new list. I'm going to give it a name called Panini. I'm now going to choose the label that is Gastro 6 and use the template Webinar. I am now going to add the Panini to the print list. I click on Add, choose my category on the left, there's a the new product, I'm going to add it and then save it. This now displays in my list, I can add a quantity, click on Print and I'm making sure that any print time prompts have been completed, such as the expiry date here. I can then click on Print, and when I open, this has now created a PDF of our new product and our new template. Before I go, I would like to mention that the support team here at Planglo pride itself on the support we can provide. Anyone can provide you with labels that stick, but we believe our level of support is unrivaled. We have been continuously updating the tutorial videos on our YouTube. You can also find these embedded within the application. Or, if you prefer, you can always reach out to us for support via the telephone, email, or even drop us a message on our integrated live chat on Label Logic Live. We are able to set you up within minutes, so please contact Planglo if you want to get started. Many thanks, Rich. That was really useful. Next, I would like to welcome all of our panellists for our Q&A section. So if someone is just getting started with labelling for Natasha's Law, where do they start? Neil, would you like to answer this one? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, Neil here. Uh, a really simple question, I suppose. Um, and there are four kind of prerequisite points that uh, we feel out of our experience are critical just to get right from the start. So point one really is where you're going to get your data from. As Richard mentioned, you can use Label Logic Live. It has its own integrated recipe builder, so you can do it all in there. Or if you've got a third party recipe builder that you're already using, we can integrate with that. Uh, and we've got a whole selection of integrations from all of major recipe builders. So that's one of the key things, where are you gonna get the information and the data from uh, to populate the ingredients for Natasha's Law? The second one, which again is a really obvious one, is you need to then determine what your actual PPDS range is going to be. Um, and then the third point leads on to the packaging. And this is really critical because your packaging is going to dictate what actual labels you're going to use. Are they going to fit on to the said items? Are the labels going to complement the kind of look and feel of the packaging? Because ultimately, though you want to be Natasha's law compliant, you still want your products to look as professional um, to your consumers as they did before. That's really critical. So just, just determine what packaging you're going to use and then just make sure that the labels are going to fit on there. An example, which I often call the culprit, is a small pot label. Uh, it can have many compound ingredients in there. It's a small item. So you need a label that's going to fit professionally on there, but that's also going to fit the information. And that leads me on to my fourth point, is then just making sure that the label can fit all of the required information, certainly for Natasha's law, and any other information you might need, such as barcodes or any um, 
address details such as that. So to get started, uh, really obvious, I know, uh, but from my experience, they are really critical points, but Planglo and the team can support you and, and, and make sure that we can assist you in that journey to get you uh, ready. Brilliant. Many thanks, Neil. Um, next, we've been asked, um, in layman's terms, what is 1.2 mil of the X height? Rich, um, what do you advise our customers on that? Sorry, Rich, we can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> Is that better? That's better. Fantastic. Sorry about that. Um, it all depends on the printer and the font that you're using. Um, in general, size seven should be fine. However, we would recommend checking the print once you've come to set it up. So set it up on the template, do a printout with all your um, items, just one of each, and then check the measurements on there. Perfect. Thank you. Someone has asked, if they put three items already individually labelled into a clear bag, does the outer bag require a label? Arvin, are you able to step in here? Um, yeah, so I think it depends on the specifics on the, the product. So um, these rules um, apply to items that are single items ready for presentation to the customer. So if your single item constitutes three things, um, in and out of packaging, um, then you would need to label the outside. However, I must say, if the pack, uh, if the things that you're including in that packaging are already pre-packed, so if it's um, something like a pack of crackers, which is already packed by another business, and then you're putting it into um, another form of packaging, it, there might be some debate about whether you need to sort of relabel it. But if the foods are PPDS and you have packaged them on the same site as um, you're, that you're selling them from, then I would say you need to label the outer of your single item. Um, so it very much depends on, on what's in your packaging um, and whether it is a single item ready for presentation to the customer. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we've also been asked, can you use any printer to print the labels or do we work with specific brands? Rich, are you able to answer this one, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so any print, uh, desktop printer or roll printer will work with our, uh, with our system, as long as there's a connection between the device that you're using and the printer itself, whether that be cabled or networked, um, it should be absolutely fine. Great, thank you very much. Um, had a question come in. Could you talk about non-sealed bags and the law on this, Arvind? Are you able to answer this one? Yeah, so it's important to come back here to the to the definition of packaging that applies. Um, so just to reiterate, the food has to be fully or partially enclosed by the packaging. The contents can't be altered without opening or changing the packaging. And the food is a single item that consists um, of the food and its packaging and is ready to sell to the final consumer. So um, the food doesn't need to be sealed to meet this definition of packaging. So you could have, for example, a loaf of bread in a paper bag that you twist over um, to make sure that it's enclosed. So you can't get to that content, the contents of that um, package without changing or altering the packaging. Um, so it's not sealed, but it still meets that definition uh, of packaging. So if in doubt, come back to that packaging. Is the food fully or partly enclosed by packaging? And it shouldn't be able to be altered without opening or changing the packaging. So it's a bit of a legalistic um, definition, but, uh, but come back to that if you want to be sure. Great, many thanks. Um, is there a grace period for labels to be updated or is it a hard date from the 1st of October? I don't know if Arvind or Callum want to answer this one. Um, so it's, it is a hard date. So if you produce food that fits into the category of PPDS, you need to make sure it's correctly labelled from the 1st of October. Um, there are, you might also produce um, non pre packed food or pre packed food, and that different labelling um, rules apply to those. So, very much do check using the decision tool on our website whether the food you produce is PPDS or not. But yes, from the 1st of October, across all UK administrations, it will need to be labelled. Great, many thanks. Um, can you add cooking instructions and add ingredients that are not on the database? And we've had a similar question come through about um, our meat is ordered for a butcher. How can that information be added? Rich, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, sure. So um, Label Logic Live allows you to add your own ingredients. 
by giving them a name, entering in any declarations that you need or nutritional values. They will then be searchable within the system itself, just alongside all the other databases. So you'll have the Airdos database and your own database that it can search from. Perfect, thank you. Um, we wrap sandwiches in cling film and then take them to the wards and then unwrap the sandwiches, serving to the patient on a plate. Do these sandwiches need labels on for transportation? Arvind, would you like to answer that one? Um, so the, the, I think the key point to remember here in terms of PPDS is that the food needs to be packaged and ready for presentation to the customer. So this, in this instance, it seems that the food is changed and unpackaged before it's ready for presentation to the customer. So arguably it's non-prepacked food um, because at the moment that it's presented to the customer, it's non-prepacked. So in this instance, you, you should still provide allergen information and provide it in the same way as you do now. So provide it in some form in writing um, or verbally. Um, but if you presented the food that was packaged on site in the packaging you, to, the, to the end consumer, you would need to label it. Great, thank you. Um, I have one just come in. If you are a home baker and you sell your products to a bakery, the products are kept in a jar and placed in a paper bag for sale. Do you need to label the paper bag? <sighs> Arvind, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, so again, it, it depends on the point at which it's packaged. So um, if you have um, the cakes loose and it, they're only packaged when a customer orders it, that's non-prepacked food. So again, you should provide allergen information, but you've got some discretion in how you present it. But if before a customer orders it, the cakes are put into individual bags um, and individual bits of packaging, then it does need to be labelled. Great, thank you. Um, we pre-pack grapes and apples in schools. Um, it will say grapes and apples um, is a full ingredient list required. I believe with fruit that that isn't a requirement. Is that correct? Um, yeah, for fresh fruit, um, you don't need to, to label the product. Great, thank you. Um, just going to see, can I download all of my product data sheets to be used on a PDA that my staff use when taking orders? This will allow them to answer specific product questions. Rich, is that something you could answer, please? Yeah, so LabelLogic Live has an in-depth reporting feature. It'll allow you to save the reports as PDFs, um, and the, the reports include product information, including declarations, allergens, and any other information attached to that particular product. So yeah, you would create a PDF and save that to the PDA. Great, thank you. Um, where primary schools are serving jelly or fruit salads in a pot. <laughs> Sorry, that question's just disappeared then. Uh, uh, would this need full ingredient labelling? The menu of the day is pre-chosen by the parent, which includes a choice of dessert, which is listed. Arvind, can you help out there? Um, so if um, food is pre-ordered, then it's not PPDS, um, so it wouldn't come under the labelling rules. So if a, if a parent has put a specific um, order in for food, that is food made to order. Um, but you should still provide allergen information in the same way as you do now in some form. Great, thank you. Um, what does sold mean? Uh, just look through the questions, sorry. Uh, um, couple of questions. No need for labelling for online ordering and phone orders, question. Um, question mark. Can we get the meeting recorded? Yes, it will be made available after the event. And for patient catering, all salad boxes or products done in house, do they need labelling or just allergen info at ward level? Um, so there's a few questions in there about online ordering and phone ordering. Um, and they, do you want to step in there, Arvind, and um, answer those, please? Yeah, so with distance selling, um, any food that you sell through that means, so online or by telephone, you should make allergen information available at the point of sale and the moment of delivery. So that continue, the rules for that continue as they do now. Um, so um, you just need to provide information on the 14 major allergens. In terms of um, foods packaged um, within, say, hospital canteens and provided to patients, 
so again the, you'll need to consider the definition of, of ppcs so if you package the food on the same location in the same location that it's offered um, and it meets that definition of packaging um, then that is ppds food um, but if you provide the food to patients in a non non prepacked form so it's plated on food on it's on a plate when it's given to them that is non prepacked food um, and you need to provide allergen information as you do now so verbally or in writing in some form so i'd, I'd very much encourage um, if you're in doubt um, check the decision tool on our website just to double check whether you produce ppds food fantastic thank you um, where did buffets fall into the regulations when not individually served Marvin, can you help out with that one? Yeah, so with buffets, it all depends on the specific setup. So if, say, um, someone's ordered a buffet um, for a specific event, you could say that that is food made to order. Um, so that wouldn't need to meet the PPDS rules, but you should still make sure allergen information is available to the consumer. Um, but if, say, you've agreed to provide um, a range of buffet items, but they haven't been specifically ordered in advance, but as part of that, you've included items that, are, that meet the PPDS criteria, then you would, so for example, individually packed sandwiches or cakes, um, and then you left them out on the buffet for people to choose themselves, that would meet the PPDS criteria. Um, so yeah, it depends on the specific setup. So you might want to, if you, you might want to approach your local authority if you want to talk about your specific setup, but there is more information um, available on our website that could be helpful with that as well. Great, thank you. And what about um, products given away for free? Um, yep, yeah, so the, the food um, that is PPDS is, applies to food that is both sold or offered or given away for free. So anything given away for free um, comes under um, these requirements as well. Great, thank you. Um, many thanks, Arvind. Um, we've had a few questions come through regarding systems which we integrate with. Um, in the comments box, you'll be able to find a list of partners. Um, if your platform is not on the list, please let us know um, as we have a number of integrations in progress. This will just be shared with you now so you can see our current partners, but do ask. Um, I know we've had a couple come through about integrations with Procure Wizard. Um, Neil, are you able to answer that? Um, we do already have integrations with Saffron. I know a few people were asking that as well. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I'm currently working with Procure Wizard. Um, as you can uh, appreciate, we've got to get this, these data strings correct. So the, the technical aspects that are going on behind the scenes uh, are progressing really well with Procure Wizard. So we're very, very, very close. So those people that already have Procure Wizard as their kind of foundation for recipes and ingredients, uh, we'll make sure that between ourselves and Procure Wizard, that that information will be readily available when the integrations are in place. But yeah, we're all, we're all uh, confident that that's all going uh, according to plan. So really positive on that one. Yeah, and we have, um... We do have um, many integration partners already, and we've just shared the link with everyone now so you can see who we already integrate with. Um, we are going to have to wrap this session up now. Um, we've had lots of questions coming in, but we will get back to everyone individually that we haven't been able to address. And we will also put the questions on, the, uh, on our website as well. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of our panellists that have taken part today and to everyone for listening. Um, we'll be sharing a recording of the video with everyone that has registered and it will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, if anyone has any questions or requires any further support regarding Natasha's Law, please contact us at natashaslaw at planglow.com. Many thanks for joining us today. Thanks to all our panellists. Bye. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.